Hi scientists, how are you going? Um, this video is to do with bonding. It's a recap on some of the work that we looked at in, uh, previously in the year. So as such, um, we'll be going through these concepts quite quickly. The first slide that we're going to look at here is our periodic table. So this is just broken down into metals, non-metals. Okay, so all of the red section here is considered metals. So you've got this zigzag uh, portion here separating the metals from the non-metals and the non-metals are in blue. Hydrogen is a special case. It's on the left hand side of the periodic table, but it is a non-metal. And the reason for that is because it has one valence electron. So you'll see that one over there. It's a bit of an exception. Now there's a bit of a summary to do with types of bonding here. Um, if a metallic atom uh, connects with another metallic atom, um, the type of bonding that exists there is metallic bonding. That's pretty easy to remember. Um, the two more difficult ones to remember are down the bottom. Ionic bonding is if you have a mixture between a metal and a non-metal. Okay? Ionic bonding involves the transfer of electrons and covalent bonding is when you have two non-metals that share electrons. We'll go into it a bit later but the key is ionic bonding is transfer of electrons and covalent bonding is sharing of electrons. The first slide is to talk about metallic bonding, okay? And the key points here are that metals exist as giant lattice structures. A lattice structure contains lots and lots and lots of metallic atoms and they're all connected together. Now metals have delocalized electrons. So delocalized means those electrons don't exist or don't stay with any specific metal atom. So they're free to move, okay? Think of local as in your local area. So delocalized means the opposite. So the fact that metals have delocalized electrons gives them a few specific properties. They allow the metal to conduct heat and electricity. Metals are great conductors of heat and electricity. A lot of metals are used in cooking, saucepans, fry pans, because they heat up quite quickly. Okay? They also cool down quickly. And they're obviously good conductors of electricity. So all of our electric um, wires, think of copper wiring, um, uses metals. The electrons that are delocalized hold the structure of metals together because metals exist as positive ions and those negative electrons um, exist as attractive electrostatic forces. So the key, the, the key to that is um, metals are held, metal atoms are held together quite tightly and therefore they have very high melting points. So melting point is obviously the temperature that's required um, if heat energy is put in for that metal to melt. Okay? And because those atoms are held together very tightly, those attractive forces are high and therefore a lot of energy is required to overcome them. They allow the atoms to slide over each other and this allows metals to be shaped so they can be bent and reformed. Think of the words um, malleable and ductile and we can shape them to how we want. This picture is just showing a metallic lattice. Basically um, each circle represents a metal ion and they're held together um, in these big structures. This is really quite a small one. They'd, they'd be much larger than that. And the delocalized electrons not shown here would be existing and not bound to any particular um, metal atom. So this is an example of delocalized electrons. Here we've got a metal spoon and we've got a bit of a zoom in to the metallic atoms and they're indicated by these gray circles. And the blue dots going through are the delocalized electrons. So they're, they're moving um, kind of where they want. They're, they exist within the metallic lattice, but they're continuously moving there. And that movement of electrons um, is actually electric current. So this electric circuit here, we have a battery with a negative and a positive terminal connected to this part here. And this part is a globe. You can see that it's kind of glowing. Um, so that is lighting up when attached to the metallic uh, section there, which is the spoon. Um, metals have delocalized electrons, which also enables them to be good conductors of heat. So here we've got the metal spoon that's being heated up by the Bunsen burner. And we can see that as the metal ions get heated, they'll start to vibrate more frequently because they're getting more kinetic energy. And they'll collide with the neighboring um, atoms there. <laughs> So they'll collide with those neighboring atoms there and they'll pass on that heat. So eventually this person that's holding that metal is going to get a, a bit of a burn. 
The second part is ionic bonding. So that exists between metals and non-metals. So um, as I said, when a metal and a non-metal atom combine, so you're looking at your periodic table in order to determine that. The metal atom donates an electron to the non-metal. The metal atom becomes positively charged because it loses an electron. So less negative charge equals a positive ion. And the non-metal atom becomes a negatively charged ion. The positive attracts the negative, and that electrostatic force of attraction is called an ionic bond. So just a simple demonstration here. We have, the, have a lithium atom, which is a metal. Lithium has three protons, as indicated here, and it has three electrons in the electron shells. Fluorine has nine protons, and it has nine electrons in two electron shells, in a 2-7 configuration. So what will happen here is the lithium will lose an electron. It does this to fill the outer shell, which is the first shell. Fluorine um, will gain one electron to fill that second shell, and it becomes a fluoride ion. Positive and negative occurs after the electron transfer, and then the electrostatic force of attraction holds them together, which is referred to as an ionic bond. And you make the compound called lithium fluoride. Here we have a second example. We have a sodium atom. Sodium has 11 protons and 11 electrons um, in a 2, 8, and 1 configuration. So this one electron is going to be the one that's transferred. Chlorine has 7 protons indicated here, so 17 electrons. If you counted them up, there would be 17 in a 2, 8, and 7 configuration. So the third shell can hold 8 electrons, so there's space here for one more. And over here, we have that electron transfer, the formation of ions, and then the electrostatic force of attraction to make the connection, which is an ionic bond. And that compound is called sodium chloride. In order to name ionic compounds, the metal is written first, that's just the nomenclature. The non-metal is written second, and the ending is changed to iod. So magnesium and oxygen connected together is referred to as magnesium oxide. Sodium and chlorine is referred to as sodium chloride. Iron and bromine is referred to as iron bromide. Now just note that the um, uh, the numbers, in the subscript numbers in the molecular formula don't affect the name, okay? So you don't need to worry about the, the numbers there at all. You just, you just name the elements, pretty simple. Sometimes ionic compounds contain complex ions, and the complex ions were the ones that we wanted to remember. So an example here is a carbonate ion. Here's a list of these ions, and you will do well to remember these. Um, so we've got carbonate, which is CO3 2 minus, Hydroxide, OH minus, nitrate, NO3 minus, sulfate, SO4 2 minus, phosphate, PO4 3 minus, and the only positive one is ammonium, NH4 plus. To determine um, formula of ionic compounds, you need to balance the charges out. So if the charges are the same, it's really simple. Opposites, um, opposites will cancel each other out after they attract. So a magnesium ion is 2 plus. And you know that based on the, the group position in the periodic table. Magnesium is in group 2, so it has a charge of 2 plus. Oxygen is in group 6, it has a charge of 2 minus. If you have your periodic table laid out in front of you, it will be really simple to figure this out. Um, and but the, the, the theory behind that is in a past video. So we've got um, MgO because the charges are balanced. Same here, Na and Cl. The charges are opposite and in the same size. So the um, compound would be NaCl. Now, if the charges are different, you can you can um, utilize the crossing over method. So all you need to do for the crossing over method, really simple. If you've got an ionic compound containing magnesium ions and chloride ions, the two from the magnesium goes to the bottom of the chlorine, and the one from the chloride charge goes onto the bottom of the magnesium. If there's a one, you don't need to write it. You can just put Mg. That the same goes up here. You don't need to write those ones. We're just doing that in order to demonstrate what's going on. So that crossing over makes MgCl2. Here, Al has a 3 plus charge. O has a 3 on the bottom. O has a 2 minus charge. And the Al has a 2 on the bottom. Easy peasy. Um, the only other complication is when you have complex ions. But don't make it more difficult than it needs to be. If it's a complex ion, it goes in brackets if it has more than one of them. So here, Mg2, the 2 goes to the bottom, OH1, that goes to the opposite side. 
and the hydroxide ion because it's a complex ion and it's complex because it has more than one element has O and H um, you need to have that in brackets same here we've got calcium phosphate calcium has a 2 plus charge phosphate has a 3 minus so swap the numbers over the 3 goes at the bottom here and the um, 2 goes at the bottom of the phosphate the last type of bonding is covalent bonding with covalent bonding we have non-metal atoms and they're sharing electrons and a um, example is uh, hydrogen hydrogen would like one more electron and they both would like one more so all they can do is simply share it covalent bonding is the friendly bonding okay so this is what um, uh, you might not have done with your brother and sister um, so we've got a covalent bond there and you've got the diatomic element H2 here we've got two fluorine atoms and they also want one extra electron these are two halogens in group 7 they're very reactive and we can see here that they'll do the exact same thing they'll come together to share those two electrons they're locked in place now and that's why they stick together and that's referred to as a covalent bond here we've got um, two hydrogen atoms and one oxygen oxygen has um, six electrons in this valence shell here it would like two more to fill that shell Hydrogen wants one more, um, just like before, so they'll come together to form uh, water, which is referred to as the Mickey Mouse molecule because of the shape that it makes. Okay. When you're naming covalent compounds, you write the names of the first non-metal as is, the second non-metal, um, the ending changes to "-ide", just like in ionic bonding, but we have to use um, prefixes in order to determine how many of those elements are present and the prefixes are listed here um, 1 to 10 so mono, di, tri, tetra, penta, hexa, hepta, octa, nona, and deca the last two you don't use all that often so NO2 would be nitrogen and O2 um, is oxide for oxygen but there's two of them so you say dioxide P2O5 P is phosphorus, there's two of them, so the prefix for two is di, so diphosphorus, and five oxygens, oxygen becomes oxide, and five of them pent or penta oxide. Carbon monoxide, because there's only one oxygen, so you have to use mono for one, and CF4 would be carbon tetrafluoride. Tetra, because there's four fluoride ions. Guys, that's all for the recap with bonding. Thank you for watching and I will see you in class.